Hey guys, welcome to part two of three of our clustering series where we're uh, comparing and contrasting, getting to the bottom of Ceph and GlusterFS. Um, in this video, we're going to kind of dive into a little more of the technical details of the difference between the two, CephFS and GlusterFS. Uh, kind of give you guys a little bit of an outline so you can get your head in the right space when trying to choose what is right for your uh, storage infrastructure. Um, by all means, too, we encourage you to reach out via phone, email, info, 45 drives, or in the comments below to get our opinions and, and to help you uh, determine what you want to uh, build. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to talk about the difference of the file systems. We're going to talk about dis how disaster recovery works and uh, just wonderful technical talks. Okay, let, let's dig into Ceph versus Gluster. So okay. we get people coming along to our customers come to us all the time and they're wanting to put in clustering and you know where 45 drive servers are perfect nodes in large storage clusters. And they come along and they want to go open source. Uh, we have proprietary options too, but they want to go open source. So in Ceph and Gluster, you very quickly boil down to the, the two biggies. So, um, and, and again, we're going to limit this to storing files. Cool. So, Gluster. So, really quickly, just give me a quick go of Gluster. In, in, in two sentences, what would you say Gluster? I say, why Gluster? What would be the main reason for why Gluster? Um, file system based, so the learning curve is short. Um, performance wise you can it's very realistic to build with underlying rate volumes so you can get very big throughput out of your array contrast to something with Ceph which we'll address next and disaster recovery one of the best parts of GlusterFS is a feature called geo-replication and it's you build a cluster in your main facility you build an identical cluster well I guess it doesn't have to be an identical cluster it just has to be the same size or bigger in another location and it just asynchronously backs up in the background you don't even notice. That is by far my favorite part of GlusterFS. So let's go over to CephFS and Ceph, the future storage and I know you're a big lover of Ceph. That's correct. Okay, so give me the quick uh, elevator pitch for Ceph. Uh, okay, so Ceph is infinitely scalable as in you, once you build a Ceph cluster that you just keep growing the Ceph cluster forever, you're done. You don't need to buy more storage. Second, Object-based, so it's well-suited for unstructured mass amounts of data, as our world is quickly moving towards, as everyone knows. Um, bit of a steeper learning curve, but once you kind of wrap your head around the concepts, you, you realize it's not as scary, it's just different. And then um, the CephFS layer, and then, so since we're narrowly talking about CephFS, that was kind of the Ceph. CephFS is a great file system layer on top of all this wonderful thing. So your, your cluster can grow forever and you still have a file system access, like a POSIX compliant file system such that you can interface with any of your existing or legacy um, uh, infrastructures. Okay, so in Ceph, just to summarize what you said, in Ceph we install this wonderful rock solid object based storage system that'll do a whole bunch more things. And then we put Ceph FS on top of that, which takes files and, and stores them as objects across this system. You got it, because you might be looking at me, anyone out in the watching this video right now going, but 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 you're talking objects and file system. How does that it's because there is a file system abstraction layer on top and that's how it communicates there. So um Yep, it does that. Um, it, it does block and object access as well, but we'll talk about that at a, a later time. And one little uh, great thing of where CephFS really shines is humongous file systems, i.e. a lot of files and directories. So the inode count is through the roof. Um, okay, okay, okay. Let's dig into that one. So inodes, this is one thing we'd really love to share with people that we think is a fundamental difference between Gluster and, and CephFS. Uh, and again, I'm going to stress that when we talk about this, Brett's going to, I'm going to ask you to tell us about, uh, about large inode situations. But large inode situations, most people don't really run into them when really super large, right? So inodes, we're talking uh, directories uh, in, in a directory. How many, odd, how many things are in there? Things can be a file. Uh, it can be another directory. You got it. That's our inodes. You got it. So when we get to very large inode counts, uh, Gluster F, what happens to Gluster FS if you get in, what, what is a large inode count? Like, uh, millions. Millions and above. 
is what it is. Um, particularly what we found through experimentation, it's not always the entire inode count of a file system. It's how big a directory is. Sure. So like if you have a million files in one directory, sure. that can cause some issues for file systems. That's not normal people that have a million files in directory systems. No, no okay. it isn't. And But not to say that if you do, then you're not normal. There's always a business case for everything, right? Yeah. But uh, So a million at, at a thousand, it's no big deal. That's an ordinary number of inodes to have in one directory. Yeah. And if you have a million in one directory, that's a lot. So there's just a dividing line for what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay, so what happens in Gluster if I have a million inodes in, uh, in one directory? Okay, so since Gluster is a file system built on top of a file system, you almost have to have two inode layers, right? So it has to keep track of everything. So long story short, ClusterFS has to, there is no central metadata. There is no humongous table of where it caches everything. It almost keeps a small window of everything. And when it's not used it anymore, it moves away. So if you're working in directory sets that all can fit in this window, not whatever, everything's snappy, you can list your files, you can find your file, comes off through, full throughput, all that fun stuff. Okay, but now you enter the scenario where I said millions, and, and you're really outside of this window. If ClusterFS has to go find the, like, okay, give me this file, you're browsing this file, and it doesn't have it in its little windowed, smaller inode cache, if you will, um, it has to go ask each server where it is. But then it's got to communicate with each server about that. So. If you're following along here, the latency of that request, all of a sudden, instead of just saying, listing, list my files, it's you go to your file explorer, you click that file, and you click it three more times because you're unsure if it opened or not. So it's when I do an LS or a file, uh, or, or I go to Finder and Mac or, or a file manager Windows. or Windows Explorer. You got it. Um, yeah, then, then, then that's when I'm seeing it. And so it's, it's that thing of trying to get a directory listing where it will start to choke when I got a humongous number of inodes. You got it, a humongous number. And again, from what we saw, it's not so much the number of inodes in the whole working directory or file system. It's, it's in that one directory you're trying to get at. So if you want one file in a directory that's 50,000 files big, okay. it's going to take a while to find that. Okay. Normal people, no, normal people, <laughs> normal, okay, normal people, Doug. No, normal, normal <laughs> use cases. You're not really going to see that, uh, but in you know, in those use cases, those people who do have use cases that have huge number of inodes yeah. in a directory, then uh, yeah, okay, we got you. And, and how does Ceph deal? With it? So, so you're what you're saying is Gloucester. It's so distributed and it, it caches inodes, so it's got to yeah. rebuild those caches. That's what slows it down. How does Ceph get around that? Uh, one note I just want to add about the Gloucester thing too is not once does this degrade the throughput. Like, if, if you know exactly where your file is, it knows exactly where to look, and it goes and throws it out at full speed. It's, it's always that, the, it's the finding of the files. Anyway, so you asked how to set handle Say that again. So, it, it, yeah, if I'm a normal user, uh, or, okay, sorry, if I'm a situation, I happen to use Gloucester, and I happen to have a huge number of inodes in a directory, um, I shouldn't actually be concerned about anything except for except for listing out that directory, right? You got it. So like wh what I'm trying to say there is if you go to Explorer and you know the full path to your file and you type that in and press go, it'll go right to it. Okay. It's if you go show me everything in this directory. You get the spinning Very interesting. Wheel. Okay. Okay, CephFS, on the other hand, built on this incredible object infrastructure, it gets around that. How does it get around that? Okay, so count, kind of counterintuitively, because you'd think a file system would be better, a file system based clustering would be better with metadata and inodes than an object based cluster. But kind of, yeah, like counterintuitively, it trims out that middle layer. You're not stacking file systems on file systems like you are with ClusterFS. It just objects, and then they put their file system layer abstraction on top of it. So, um, so in Gluster, we're fully decentralized, submachines. So you and they ha each machine has its own file system, and then there's a, the Gluster layer on top of that. It has to track all that. And so we've talked about it and, and how it kind of chokes a little in these extreme situations. So in Gluster, we have metadata servers. Tell us a little bit about metadata servers. Okay, so a metadata server, or as you'll see a lot, Ceph, MDS. They're uh, um, services that can be co-located on other servers or on standalone hard hardware that um, handles all the abstraction logic, if you will, from okay. from um, when the user sees a file system and then how that translates and dumps it out into objects into the actual cluster. Okay. So from the user's point of view, they have no idea they're dealing with objects. 
They just see a file system there. But because of that, you can have a huge file. You can have these metadata servers just spending all their time keeping track of the file system tree and the inodes and all so that. So if you go to look up a directory, it's done through your metadata server and it just spits it right out because it's on hand and all it. all snows and all you, synced with the storage machines. Yeah, so that, that whole almost like window cache, like I was talking about with GlusterFest and asking all the others, it doesn't have to do that anymore. Gotcha. So, um, metadata servers. Let's talk about metadata servers because uh, we build clusters with them co-located on the storage servers. Mm -hmm, that's correct. Just run them as a virtual machine on a virtual machine inside the... N not even that far. Like you could... They, they're, or is there service, just you, service they're, they're services that run in actually... It really, that question you asked is a great question. Uh, some people who know at Red Hat, they're really investigating the idea of containerizing. Um, Ceph services, which is, for those who know about containers, it's they're almost like VM light. Anyway, that is out of the scope of this video, but it's a really cool idea of where they're going with that. Okay, so, but it could be put on anything. Basically, it's a service that runs, you can put it anywhere in your network. You, you got it, that's yeah. exactly it. You can have another hardware, you can put it on your desk, your desktop, like obviously. Because I know one of our internal clusters that we have running mm -hmm. here, you've uh, co-located them on your storage service. That is correct. And so, it runs great, and I think that's a three machine cluster, yep. correct, with three metadata servers, one running in each? Yep, that is correct. So the idea there was, based on our load and the amount of data we had and the number of files in it, we could co-locate those services. And the nice part of Gluster too is, uh, or Gluster, I'm sorry, nice part of Ceph there is when, um, should we see an issue, oh, you know what, we're getting latencies because of these collated servers, we'll just put some hardware, we'll spin up three services on the other ones and then kill the three that are co-located and then all we've migrated. So you're never locked into anything there. So yes, that's okay. that's what we built. Okay, not locked in, that's nice. Yeah. That, that is one of the beauties of clustering, isn't it? You can just add more machines yeah. on it. You can change stuff around as you, as you want. You got it. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed part two of three we, where we uh, kind of broke down the differences between CephFS and GlusterFS and what that means between uh, disaster recovery metadata, inodes, and all that fun file system stuff. So questions, comments, please uh, leave them in the comment box below. Yeah, and join us uh, for the next video, part three, where we kind of uh, wrap up the whole solution, introduce some of the extra little stuff you need with Ceph, and really give you the full whole picture of what a Ceph solution and a Gluster solution is and how that works for you.